everyone. I'm Manisha and this is Teach Your Kids. We are a podcast about homeschooling, whole child development, and the future of education. And today we are going to be talking about nature-based learning. I am so delighted to welcome one of my besties, Rachel Tidd, to the show. It's always fun having a good friend here. <laughs> and Rachel is the founder of Wild Learning, which is an amazing nature-based curriculum. I actually met Rachel because I did a ton of research on the best curriculum for different children and found so many parents who were just raving about this incredible evidence-based, effective, wholesome, wonderful curriculum to teach their children reading according to the science of reading and math in a mastery-based, wonderful approach and all in the beautiful, natural outdoors, which is just incredible. So welcome to the show, Rachel. (laughs) Thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk with you again. Yay. So I just want to brag about you a little bit more so people have some context. Rachel is a former special education teacher turned entrepreneur and a homeschooling mom of two adorable kids. Uh, She has a master's degree in elementary and special education from Bank Street College of Education and a bachelor's of science in environmental science from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And she's currently a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in educational sustainability. And we haven't really gotten a chance to talk about that yet. So I'm really excited to learn about it. So, Rachel, just to, I think we should just dive in. And I would just love if you could share the story of why you created Wild Math and Wild Learning, what you were doing, and how this curriculum emerged. Like you said, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, <laughs> but a long time ago, my kids are getting older now, but um, I had two little ones and they were challenging in their own different ways. Um, And we decided to go down that homeschool route for a variety of reasons. And I had both of my kids in an outdoor nature preschool, forest preschool. It was all outside. They never went inside. Um, And both my kids are super different. And it really um, helped both of them in their own way. And particularly my youngest, who had at the time a lot of sensory challenges. Um, We were having them evaluated. and. the teachers really didn't see any of the issues that we were seeing at home at preschool. And that was really, as a special ed teacher, um, that was really eye-opening. And I started looking into this and thinking about it. And we had already old homeschooling my oldest. I knew I'd be homeschooling my youngest. And I was like, well, if outside is the ticket for him to learn, then we I need to figure out how to do, you know, kindergarten and first grade, reading and math outdoors. And I started experimenting. I started researching. There's not a lot out there for math and reading. Um, And so I started doing my own thing using my background and education and my experience teaching. Um, And people, friends saw me doing this. They said, you should write this down. I was like, no, no, no. Who has time for that? (laughs) Homeschooling mom. And um, I eventually did. And it has just grown into what it is today. And uh, I published a book for uh, teachers and parents this spring. And it's just really grown beyond any... um, Beyond my imagination, for sure. It's amazing how big you are. I mean, at this point, how many families have used wild learning? So many. I mean, it's hard to say because I uh, have participated and teamed up with other people and like homeschooling bundles, probably 30, 50,000 people. I mean, a lot. Yeah. It's incredible. And I just love how you kind of almost became an accidental entrepreneur, which seems to be the case of a lot of teachers. I think a person who founded Teachers Pay Teachers, which is such a wonderful resource. And, you know, it's just a testament to your creativity and generosity and solving your own problem. I wanted to kind of wind it back a little. Um, you use the term sensory challenges, which not everyone might be familiar with. So could you perhaps 
articulate what you mean by that term and some of the things that you were observing, which um, made you feel like this was an issue that was happening with your son? Yeah. So sensory issues are, are, are there's lots of different kinds of sensory, sensory issues. Um, sensory integration disorder is kind of like a diagnosis you might get from an occupational therapist. And it usually ha- means that kids are having trouble um, taking different sensory inputs. So whether it's visual or vestibular, which is like, um, like kids like to spin or they like really deep pressure. Um, mine was a sense what's called a sensory seeker. So he, he wanted more sensory input, more touch, more pressure, more jumping, more spinning than like an average kid. Um, so he sought that out. And sometimes that was like with you and your body. Um, sometimes that was like really hardcore, like rough and tumble play, just like more. And it, it, it becomes like, it's, if it's, an issue, right? It's like, it kind of interferes with your daily life, you know, like clothes don't feel good. And you refuse to have a meltdown, you know, he was like three, have a meltdown because you don't like the sound or the feel of your snowsuit. Um, things like that can be a sensory related. Um, does that help? <laughs> That's very helpful. I mean, yeah. and it's, it's just interesting for parents to see. And I'm curious, what your, was your conclu- what was your conclusion ultimately about why this was manifesting at home and not at school? Yeah. So we had him evaluated. I'm a special ed teacher. I really wanted to get a little more information about, you know, the challenges we were seeing. He was basically using my body to get the sensory <laughs> input he needed. Right. Or you know, we had a swing inside. We had a crash pad, which is like a big giant pillow that you can just like jump on and slam your body into. Um, But in preschool, in forest preschool, I should say, in forest preschool, um, you know, when we go outside, the rules are different. You can be louder. More movement is allowed. And the activities they did were really multisensory by design, by, I want to say nature, but that sounds weird in a nature based. It's a different meaning of nature. Um, so they would do things like um, bounce on logs, the like bouncy logs that kind of bounce on their own. If you've ever seen like the perfect tree that when you bounce on it, like you jump on it, it bounces. <laughs> right, yeah. um, that's giving a <laughs> yes, ton of vestibular and sensory input. This is something they did for fun. Um, sliding down uh, a mud like path on their bottoms or sledding or skating around. I live in upstate New York. So skating around on ice and sliding with our boots and breaking ice ice and smashing ice and climbing trees um, and playing in water and picking up rocks and just exploring and hiking. Um, hiking at three is you know, different, but it's still hiking to them. <laughs> it's still hiking, um, yeah. You know, they have their backpacks on. Right, and okay. You know, they're sitting, even just like sitting at lunchtime, they're using so much um, of their body and balance mm. because they're sitting on a log. They have their lunchbox on their lap. Like, this is hard for an adult. They have to open the lunchbox. They have to hold the lunchbox and eat at the same time. And they're listening to a story usually. So it's a lot of... It's a lot. And it's like, so it was meeting is what we decided and in the OT determined that the outdoor environment of this preschool and these types of activities were giving him that sensory input that he needed and he was craving and not getting in an indoor environment or at home. You know, so that was, that was why. And so, yeah. Got it. So it was the forest school where he was actually not exhibiting the same behaviors. He was in that closed environment. Yes. I often think about how many spaces are not really designed for children. And it's wonderful that he was able to get that rich stimulation outside and wonderful. So you use the term, the science of reading quite a bit when you talk about wild reading. What is the science of reading why is it not in every curriculum and why do you think it's so important? Yeah. So this is a 
hot topic right now in the news, if you've been paying attention um, to education news. Um, and I think I'll start off by saying, so science of reading and the way I think of it, I don't, I don't try to get into the, the so-called reading w wars. I don't think it's a war. war. I think we all want the same thing. We want kids to learn how to read. Um, and the science of reading is just a body of scientific studies and research and knowledge that we have gained in the 30, last 30 years about how our brain works, how we learn to read, and how we can teach reading to help kids learn read based on that research. Um, for a long time, that research wasn't really well known and it wasn't making its way into classrooms. And it's still in a lot of places is not making its way into classrooms. Um, and so I think I, you know, that same little boy, <laughs> um, has dyslexia and it, um, was a very different experience dealing with that learning disability as a parent than it was as a teacher. Um, and I saw it from a very different side and I saw the struggle every single day and how it affected, um, our, our family life even, you know, like, can you read this to your brother, you know, and, and we're going over this over and over and over it. It's a completely different level. And to know how many students I had that struggled, I know that it wasn't being taught. I, when I was an early teacher, I wasn't necessarily always teaching it how it should be taught because I was mandated to use certain programs. So how shouldn't it be taught? I mean, it's hard to summarize, but um, a lot of people think that the science of reading is just about phonics and phonics is an important part. Um, we should be teaching phonics right from the get-go, we need to teach the code um, explicitly and systematically, but it doesn't stop there. It also starts beforehand. We want to work on language skills and phonological awareness, which is hearing those individual sounds, identifying those sounds, matching those sounds to letters. Um, we need to have that all rhyming, being able to like manipulate words. So like changing the word pat and putting a, a B sound on the front and making it bat those kind of letter games all build that kind of skill. And then after the phonics, while we're doing the phonics, it's important to still read aloud and work on language comprehension because that becomes your reading comprehension. And you want to be building knowledge um, while you're doing that too, because you can't read or think or write if you don't have any background knowledge. You need something to read, think, and write about. Um, and so, you know, sometimes the, the translation of the science of reading has become very narrow and in, in phonics focused when it really encompasses all of these things. What was happening before and is still happening in many places is something called three queuing. And it was when we were telling kids, um, giving kids mixed messages. Um, we were saying, look at the picture. What do you think would make sense? Um, what word do you think would make sense here? And, and we weren't necessarily, some people were teaching some phonics, which is great. But what happens is we were often, even if we were teaching phonics, we would switch to this, well, what do you think would make sense? And we're discounting that the words can be decoded. And people will say, oh, English is too crazy. You can't decode it. Well, actually, it's very decodable. Um, and there is a sequence to learn it and, and it can be taught. And it's not, it's not so crazy. Um, there's rhyme and reason to it. And we can teach that to kids. Um, the thing with the brain in the three queuing is when we are telling kids to look at the first letter, look at the picture, take a guess, we're actually flipping our the processes in our brain to the wrong side of the brain. So we're reinforcing paths that are inefficient for reading by telling them to, um, to look at the picture. And so we're, we're reinforcing poor reading habits. Those are what poor readers do is they look at the picture and they look at the first word because they don't have the decoding skills. When you read, you look at the whole word and you look at all of the letters, no matter how you've been taught, you really do. Even as really good readers, we still do it, even though we don't think about it. When we look at a word, 
we look at all the letters, we what's called map that word orthographically in our brains. And when we tell kids to look at the picture, they're not reinforcing that orthographic mapping. They're not looking at those letters. They're not making that pathway stronger. And you need a lot of practice and repetition and kids with dyslexia need even more. Um, So we're moving it over here instead of like making it stronger where we need it to be on the on the other side of the brain. And so that's where the science comes in. And we didn't really know that until we had MRIs. And so that's where the science has really informed our instruction. If that helps. Does that help? That is so helpful. Thank you so much because it's such an articulate description of how to teach reading and why that works. And just so fascinating that we can actually use an MRI to see a child's brain learning how to read or an adult's learn learning how to read for that matter. And I, I do want to talk about nature-based curriculum, but I want to dig a little bit more into reading because... I feel that there's another part of this debate that needs to be explored, especially for a community like mine and a community like yours, um, which is primarily secular homeschooling families, um, also some religious families who want to use evidence-based scientific curriculum. And there are some, there's also a kind of homeschooler called an unschooler. And there's a wide range of beliefs within the unschooling community. Um, a range of structure, but some parents will say, I don't need to teach my child how to read. In an environment, in my environment, they will learn how to read by themselves. And I'm curious to know your honest opinion about that, both as a special ed teacher, a homeschool parent, and also from what you've observed being a member of a homeschooling community. Yeah. So nothing against... um Unschoolers, I have totally done unschooling in the past, some, you know, in some phases of, of our life and situations. And I know some amazing unschoolers who do an amazing job. But this is one part that I really have trouble with. And I'll tell you why. Um, so, um, there's something called the ladder of reading, Nancy Young's ladder of reading. And I have a video and it happens to be one of my most controversial videos. Um, and basically through research, it shows that, um, 60%, I think it's 60 or 70% of kids will need some, at least some instruction in decoding and phonics to learn how to read, to break the code. They might need, might, they might not need it all, but they will need some, ex- some exposure to explicit instruction in the code to learn to read. Where in the homeschool community, what I have seen is you have kids whose brains are wired for reading and they have one the brain lottery for sure. Um, I have one of these kids as <laughs> when well. It comes I to have reading. one on both sides. <laughs> yeah. So I can see this from both angles. I have a, my oldest learn to read on his own at three years old. That is one of the reasons we decided to homeschool. And so when you have that experience, and often people do, right? Well, my kid just learned how to read. So I don't need to teach. Kids to, can, will learn on their own. Well, these kids, these 20, 15, 20% of kids that their brains are wired for reading and for whatever reason, or for whatever reason, maybe they put a lot of effort into it. I don't know. Um, some kids do to break that code. Um, they read on their own effort- effortlessly, right? But on the flip side, there's those 70% of kids that are gonna, that are gonna need some explicit instruction. And then, there's the 20%, which is my other kid, that's going to need explicit, long-term, very specific, sequential phonics and reading instruction to break the code. So if you never... You don't know where your child (laughs) is going to be in that continuum, right? You don't... It's like rolling the dice, right? You have multiple kids, they could all, they're all could be different. Um, so you don't really know. So if you're not providing any instruction, I mean, you certainly can wait until seven or eight to do reading uh, instruction if you want. And many people who uh, 
our Waldorf um, homeschoolers believe in waiting. Developmentally, yes, five-year-olds do not have to be learning to read. They never did. Um, and in kindergarten, now they do. You know, so it's certainly you can wait and see how your child is doing. Um, and those warning signs that they're not uh, learning letter sounds is really difficult, that they're not blending sounds. Um, they just have no interest. It's like print doesn't exist. <laughs> I had one of those. Um, you know, these are warning sounds that you might want to provide some instruction because what happens is if you're in the, if your child's in that lower 20% or in that 70% is you're just, they might, they might eventually figure it out, but it's going to be really arduous and they might really not enjoy reading. Um, when you could have just provided a little bit of instruction for most of those kids would have been perfect. And then they, we often say they take off, right? It's because they've, they've gotten the amount of instruction they need to figure out that code and they just go. Um, so I think if you unschool, yeah, like I, I, that's my worry is that often, you know, I know people that have waited till, well, my, my 12 year old can't read and he'll read when he's ready. But what if he won't be ready because he needs that instruction? Um, and that's on you. You're in charge of your child's education. And so it's, you know, as a parent, you can make whatever choice you want. That's just my um, reading, science and educator take on it, if that makes sense. <laughs> that is such a great perspective. And I would frame it almost as it's a parent's job to keep a child safe. And reading is a tool and handwriting still is a tool that's critical for being able to navigate the world. And I think sometimes we take that skill for granted, being part of a privileged society. I interviewed um, Dr. Cheryl Field-Smith on the show, who's an expert in Black homeschooling. And she was telling... In, African-Americans in the United States have always been innovators when it comes to education, paving the pathway a lot more than people realize. And she was telling the story of slaves, a slave who hid in a ditch and went blind teaching himself how to read. That's how and said he never regretted it. That's how valuable it is to someone who doesn't know how to read, who wants freedom in the world. And we see in the developing world, learning how to read is the most important way you can empower women, promote economic development, human rights, and child marriage. So it's, it's a thing of value and beauty and a gift that you can give to your child. And unfortunately, I mean, I was talking to Blair Lee as well, who runs C Homeschoolers, and she knows so many unschooling families where the kids are 18 or 19 and don't know how to write, don't know how to read, don't know how to write a resume. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions. And just one more anecdote is Carrie McDonald, who wrote Unschooled, talks about teaching your children to read and says, that's because all of my children were in literacy-rich environments. They taught themselves how to read, but their mom is a scholar, right? So even if you're not giving explicit phonics instruction, you have an influence in your own background. So yeah, um, so, I mean, even if you have a literacy rich environment, I would say um, it depends. I mean, when I'm reading aloud, or when I'm reading aloud to my kids, you know, I'd often point out the words and, this, you know, and you're giving a lot of instruction there. But you have to be careful that I, it, it's a slippery slope. Um, because if you have one of those kids that's in the 20 or 30%, they're going to need more than that. And what happens if you don't and you wait till you're 12 or you're 18 is you're missing all of that reading that, you know, that's 10 to 15 years of reading and get knowledge gaining and exposure to vocabulary. There is a lot in written language that is not in spoken language. And so, um, you kind of, you're, they they are missing something. I'm, will they be fine? Probably, but um, or, or know, probably not. I mean, it's not about. always the case. Yeah. So, I mean, you this, know, this is great, Rachel. I mean, I think that this gives a lot of people a lot to think about when yeah, it comes I mean, it's to just reading. A parent decision, right? It's one of those things. You research the information which we we're giving, um, our point of view and our expertise, and then you know, parents make their own shows, choices and. For sure. I mean, it does come back, does come down to that, especially in the United States. And I think this actually might be a good segue into math. 
because one, I guess I've noticed, I've heard from a couple college professors that sometimes there are, there are kids who are extremely gifted in math that come into programs in math at colleges and universities. And it is, and they've always excelled in all their classes, just super, super bright. And at a certain point in advanced math, they get stuck because they never actually learned how to solve the problems. And they're then at a huge disadvantage. So I'd love for you to explain how you created Wild Math, which I believe was the first program before Wild Reading, and why you felt there was a need for a different approach to math, what that math approach is, and how it helps children cultivate the problem skills they need, problem solving skills they need to excel in math. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> in one sentence. <laughs> in one sentence. In one minute. Um, yeah. So wild math. Um, I actually struggled with math in school. I moved a lot. And so I didn't have a uh, very continuous math instruction. Um, but when I started teaching math, when I started learning how to teach math in graduate school, um, you know, how we taught math had changed a bit. And it was more about um, being flexible with numbers and being able to solve problems and um, think about numbers in different ways and apply them in strategies than when I learned, which was, you know, a worksheet and the process and carrying the one and doing 30 problems and getting them all right, right? Um, so the focus had been taken off. And I really, really enjoyed teaching math this way. It was a lot of manipulatives. Um, I went to Bank Street College of Education. They're very progressive. Um, and so um, it was an eye-opening experience. And I really enjoyed it. And the kids all would say, if you ask them, especially in the younger grades, what's your favorite subject? They would say math. Because it was such a engaging way. It was kind of like mm. playing. Mm -hmm. um, because we did a lot of hands-on, a lot of manipulatives, a lot of thinking, um, a lot of games. And so I really wanted to bring that experience outside. Um, so instead of plastic manipulatives, Wild Math uses lots of natural materials, either pre-gathered or gathered in the moment, whatever you may have, um, to kind of give a hands-on understanding to construct that hands-on um model of what you're doing before you go on to paper and pencil and algorithm. Um, because you really want to build kids understanding. And so when you just teach, let's say, <laughs> um, addition and subtraction, like multi digit with, with regrouping, um, you really want kids to understand what that means when we're carrying the one and um, why we're borrowing or regrouping that 10 before you say, all right, here's the step. So, you know, 21 plus 42 or whatever it is, right? And now you carry the one and you can just cross this out and, you know, cross this out, put it over here. Now it's a 13 or whatever it is. Um, that's a process. And that doesn't show that you understand what's going on. So when you get up to the higher math, that's Sure, you're going to get the right answer. You're going to pass all your tests. But when it may be not multi digit adding subtraction, but it adds on in each layer, right? You get higher and higher. And then you can't, you don't have the number sense and the understanding to think about problems in any other way than this very specific way. And so, um, in wild math and in a lot of math programs now, we really are working on kids' um, flexibility with numbers and thinking about solving problems in more than one way. So I teach in wild math um, this adding and subtracting multi-digit numbers in three different ways. Um, and I encourage parents to let their kids use whatever way that they like or feel most comfortable with. And that can change as they get better. We use a hundreds chart. We use um, what I call place value sticks, which are just like base 10 blocks um, that you often see in classrooms. Um, you can use a number line. You can use an open number line, which I have a whole video about. Um, it's a great tool. And then you can also 
And it doesn't mean I don't teach, but you can also teach the standard algorithm. And sometimes it's best to do that last. You show them all these ideas. It is a faster, more efficient way. Sure. It has less understanding. And so you kind of want to show all those ways. So does that, does that That explains it so well? I mean, you've really are, you've articulated something I experienced so many times in public school classrooms when I was running all over the place in New York City, dropping into classes and teaching whatever lesson happened to be on the agenda today. And I think that is the core of the problem of what's happening in our public schools is that, and private schools, is that children are being taught techniques and they're not being taught conceptual understanding. They're memorizing ways to solve them. And I I just have this memory. I will never forget. I was teaching math in a second grade classroom and they were working on... I think it was long division that day. And there were these numbers kind of in a row and some system that you're supposed to solve the problem. And I just looked at it and I did not get it. I just had no idea what was going on. So I just kind of looked around the room and said, is there anyone here who understands how to do this? And I let a second grade girl teach the whole class because... I mean, I know how to long, do long division, but I just did not know how to do that <laughs> the way the worksheet. So I love that you're giving three different strategies and you're letting them kind of ruminate themselves on solving the problem first and then providing a technique when they already, when their appetite is already wet for solving the problem. And there it's like, okay, great. You know, I want to make truffles. Well, maybe play around and then here's a recipe right, <laughs> that you can follow. So that's so fantastic, Rachel. I love that. And I, you really handled all the different threads of that, that yeah, question you, well. <laughs> you brought up something interesting too, um, that these are not ways that we most likely learned math. And um, that can make people feel really uncomfortable. Um, and it, it doesn't mean what we did is wrong and or these other ways are really any better. They're just different and kind of what we want from kids is a little bit different than we wanted when we went to school. You know, we have, we all have calculators in our pockets, you know, um, and that wasn't the case before. And we have computers to do lots and lots of calculations faster than we ever would and more accurately. What we can't, what we really want are kids that can solve problems and can use math to solve problems. And so our focus has changed a little. Um, And that can be really hard for parents to kind of think about. They're like, oh, this is a new math. It's not really new math. It's just we're we're really focusing on understanding and problem solving as opposed to being a calculator. I love that. And we want our children to have fun and solving problems is fun. So, all right, let's dive into nature-based learning. (laughs) <laughs> which is just so wonderful. And I, I will just say there, there is um, Rachel's program is math and reading and it's the best out there. And there's also a program that covers more subjects, which is blossom and root, which is, all, which always recommends um, wild learning as a compliment because they don't have math. Um, math is very difficult to teach, but there are not a lot of nature-based curriculums out there that I would say are really top notch like yours. So Maybe could you kind of give people a sense of this history of the nature-based learning movement? I mean, we see forest schools. How did this emerge? Um, and and what's it what's happening today in nature-based learning? A lot is happening. So <laughs> I think it kind of um originally started, you know, I mean, we've always taught kids outside and there's sure you know, Charlotte <laughs> yeah, Mason. That was kind of the original way to learn, right? We were all in nature. <laughs> yes. Right, and then, right. you know, the environmental movement really got people interested in teaching kids about nature and the environment. But most recently, I feel like um, we, people got very interested in what was happening in places like Sweden and Finland in their forest schools. And they have forest schools for what we would call preschool. Their preschool goes a little older than ours. Um, and they are all outside. It is very cold and snowy, just like here. But some people are like, what? Outside? Isn't it too cold? But well, they're doing it in Sweden and Finland in the snow. And it's and they get, you know, great rel- great results in their education system. And so people were like, there's really something to this. And a few people started doing it here in the United States. And it's really caught on, especially 
huge growth in um, early childhood nature-based learning. People are really seeing the benefits of taking kids outside, especially um, younger kids in their development. Um, we are starting to see this go up in uh, the grades. People especially um, are looking for getting their kids outside more, are wanting more recess, are wanting their kids to go outside. The schools are not necessarily uh, responding to that, um, but parents have taken it in their own hands. And and you can see that with the success of, uh, of wild learning in the curriculum because parents are often choosing to homeschool because they want their kids outdoors more, they want their kids moving more, um, they want a more hands-on experience. And so I think the schools are going to start, and some are. I have talked to some amazing educators. I know in Canada, they're definitely um, doing more of this. Um, Durham County Schools in North Carolina are doing an amazing job of this. There's There are definitely schools that are doing this. And I'm hoping that more get on board. And that's why I wrote that book. So... Mm. Yeah. So tell us about the book. What, um, who is an ideal candidate to read this book and what can we learn from it? Yeah. So the book's called Wild Learning Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outdoors. And it was inspired by wild math and wild reading for sure. And I expanded it and I wrote it in a little bit of a different to tone or point of view um, than the curriculums. Um, Many, especially wild reading is written more for a parent. Many, many schools use both. Um, but that was kind of who I originally wrote it for. Um, so the book is more towards teachers and educators or other people working with more than one or more than a couple, um, teachers or, or students. And so it's more towards, uh, an educator or teacher audience for sure. Many, many homeschoolers have I've bought and used it, but I give a lot of examples of like more like the management piece of how to put kids in groups. And I wouldn't say in wild reading, put your kids in groups and of two to work on this, you know, like it's a very, a little bit different, but very it's an essential part of classroom teaching is behavioral management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like all these little management parts of like, and what's appropriate natural materials wise with one or two kids in your own backyard is very different when you have 25 kids using materials. Like you have to be a little bit more um, aware of treating nature with respect when you have a lot of kids. Still can be done. You just have to think of it a little bit differently. Um, and so the book is really for that. It covers like K through five, fifth or sixth. Um, and it goes through... I kind of tried to design it to make it very accessible no matter where you lived or wherever your school was. And so instead of doing a lot of nature books organized by seasons, I organized um, by zones of what I call accessibility. And so the first chapter is all activities that you can do in your schoolyard or your backyard, very close. You don't need a permission slip. You don't need a bus. You don't need to go anywhere. Just right there. Um, lots of things that you can do, whether you're in an urban environment or a natural environment, because a lot of people um, mistake outdoor learning and nature learning with having to be in like a pristine environment. And I don't really prescribe to that. Is that important? Sure, it's an important experiences and I wish kids all all kids had that experience is frequently. However, it's not not the reality for most. Um so after the schoolyard, I move out to the neighborhood, whatever that neighborhood may look like. Um those activities in the book are more oriented to what you would think of as a neighborhood in a town or a village or a city. Um if you live in a very rural area, you might flip flop these two chapters. So the next chapter is farther afield. And that is where it's more, uh, you might take a bus, it's, it's more oriented towards very natural or parks or that kind of a, a setting. So if you lived in a rural area, you might switch because you might actually take transportation to visit a town or a city, right? I mean, 
I live in a very rural area and that is what we did. We, we have to go to town for that experience where we go outside in our backyard around our neighborhood was very, is very natural. That makes sense. And the way that you are making this nature-based curriculum accessible to children in urban environments is really satisfying the equity piece of this question. How can we extend nature-based learning to all? Because the reality is that a lot of the time, children who don't have as many resources are in areas that might not be as naturally pristine, which is not always the case. Um, so there's also rural poor, and, but it's it's wonderful that you have made this accessible to all through that. So, wow, this it's just a, such amazing what you've built. And Rachel, I think one of the things that's quite unique about you is that you have this extraordinary background in neuroscience, pedagogy, and you're also kind of a nature-loving tree hugger <laughs> totally. at the same time. Did you see my phone? It's like yes, leaves. It's wow. all leaves. I love that. I, and, I, and I love you for it. So... Perhaps per, you could kind of tell people a little bit about some of the neuroscientific benefits of learning outside. What, it, what, how does nature contribute to a child's brain development and their learning? Well, there's a ton of benefits to going outside and learning outside. And there's been a lot of research in this area, um, not necessarily on the academics side. There's been some there, um, but on the other side, such as increasing engagement, um, increasing attitude towards positive attitude, I should say. <laughs> I, I have a team, not that kind of attitude. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and those are really important. You know, we have kids that are very unmotivated often to learn or they, school is hard for them. And if you can increase engagement and attitude just by going outside, it's free. Um, that's the other thing. Going outside is really free and accessible. Um, and so these were often trying to boost all of these things I'm going to talk about, including engagement and attitude in our students or our own children um, in our classrooms. And we're struggling with them. But if we can go outside, we can improve them. Um, also, studies have shown that your stress, stress levels and cortisol levels drop um, when you go outside. And so a lot of kids are experiencing a lot of trauma and anxiety. Um, and these have consequences for your health for well into the future. And so you're reducing cortisol, you're reducing, you know, cardiovascular risk, uh, all kinds of things of heart attacks. Um, so it's really, it's not a trivial thing. Um, also, vision, you know, we spend so much time looking close up in at, uh, computer screens. <laughs> and um, this is actually really affecting kids vision development, we need to be able to see far away. Um, and the natural light outside really helps um, your vision and um, the development of that vision. And so it has a full spectrum of light as opposed to indoors. And so going outside gives us that um, vision boost that kids really need. And people don't even think about that. I mean, you don't think about that. Um, vitamin D, right? Boosts our immune system. So we're like boosting health on multiple issues. We're boosting our development. Um, also physically, right? Kids can move. Um, we don't move enough. We're kind of movement starved. And so um, by going outside, we're getting kids out of their seats in their classrooms. They're actively learning. Um, and that is really important to those kids that need to move a little bit more, need that sensory input. Going outside is naturally multisensory. And all of these little things add up. And I think they add up to better achievement. Absolutely. Creativity, focus, happiness, all contribute to learning. Yeah, there's even been studies that just having more green outside your window does boost, boost test scores. So that's super interesting. Um, and then finally, my favorite is, because <laughs> it always comes back to literacy and math for me. I know, I can't help it. Um, so for me, I think the outdoor experience and seeing nature and experiencing nature and learning about nature 
does a couple of things. And one of those things is that it builds background knowledge. And we know that you cannot comprehend something if you have no background knowledge. So math is the language you, of nature, right? Yeah, math and a reading any book you read about anything outside, if you have no idea, um, my favorite, yeah, it gives context, it gives I teach phonics a lot um, with road signs, like parking signs, and it gives a real concept. Like, here are the words. They're not just a list on a worksheet. Here it is. It's telling us something. It's telling us when to park here and when not to. Um, and I think that context and that meaning is really important. But my favorite, one of my favorite examples for comprehension is we often teach flowers with that, you know, as soon as I say it, you, I know you know what I'm talking about. That diagram of the flower part yes. right, with this like <laughs> random flower. Everyone knows. Everyone yep. knows what that is. Everyone has done We've that. all used it. But flowers don't really look like that. Very few <laughs> look like that. And they all look really different, right? And Completely. So in real life, what a flower looks like is totally different. And so you have that experience of seeing anthers in three different flowers is really going to inform you when you're reading about flowers, about plants, about biology as you get older. And it it all adds to your collective background knowledge. And every time you read something, it adds to that collective knowledge. And so you're really building. Um, And so it's hard without, if you have some of these real life pieces missing to, you know, learn about the world, you're like missing the foundation. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. And I have that image of that flower right in my mind and can't remember any of the parts except maybe the petal. (laughs) And uh, wow. So when you decided to pursue your doctorate, many of your friends wondered why such a brilliant, informed, successful woman needed to get a PhD. Are you happy with the program? What are you learning? Oh, I, uh, you know... I love learning and it's a little bit different when you choose to go back when you're older uh, because it's really your choice and it's all about your own learning and you're learning for yourself. Um, So I am at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in the Educational Sustainability Program, which is a little, it's, it's a, you know, different topic. It's kind of a rare topic, but they really understood my outdoor learning and uh, pedagogy kind of perspective. And I'm looking at, um, well, I'm hoping to look at, um, I am looking, uh, literacy (laughs) and outdoor learning and sustainability and how we can integrate sustainability into the ELA curriculum because we are facing a changing world and the kids now are going to be the ones that have to make a lot of decisions and solve a lot of problems, but they need the tools and the knowledge to do it. And we're not doing, it's a very new field and we're not doing a great job of teaching some of these uh, thinking skills like futures thinking and systems thinking at the Definitely not the primary level, but I would say K-12 at all. Um, There's been a lot of research at the higher ed level, but it hasn't really trickled down beyond science. Um, And it's kind of my same argument that if we wait to go outside for just science time, we're really missing an opportunity, which is why I focus on math and reading. Those are also our foundational skills, which we need. Um, If we wait and we only do sustainability for like a class or two in science, um, remember science and social studies have really been pushed out of our schools because of testing focus. Um, The amount of instructional minutes devoted to them have decreased since uh, No Child Left Behind way back when. Um, And so we really have very few opportunities to give that ki- give kids that information. And I think there are so many connections between reading and writing and thinking, which is a huge part of sustainability is content and thinking, these cr- critical thinking skills, um, that it can be easily in- integrated. And then of course, I'm putting in my uh, 
outdoor learning, place-based learning spin to it. So I'm developing a new curriculum um, to pilot in schools, hopefully in 2025. That is so exciting. And I know that wild math and wild reading is already starting to be integrated in some of the public schools, which really gives me hope for the education system and its ability to grow and improve instead of just fall apart. And when you talk about systems thinking, I actually interviewed um, one of the scientists at Project Drawdown. Um, and she was talking about how video games can be a good way to encourage systems thinking. And I know that you have some rather strong views about children using educational apps and software. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Should parents be limiting their children's screen time? How much is appropriate? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is another one of those great... Uh parent choice, right? <laughs> I'm and... asking you all of the <laughs> controversial questions because I love you so very much. <laughs> it's great. It's, you know, if we don't, we have to talk about controversial We have to talk issues. about it. We have mm -hmm. to talk. We have to hear p different people's perspectives. And your perspective might may be different than mine. And it may be different than somebody down the street or people in my homeschool co-op or whatever. Um, and that is totally fine. And I think it's, we, there's a lot of value in talking talking about what you think and hearing what other people think. And you might adjust based on what I hear from other people or I may, you know, it also really depends on the age of your kid, in my opinion, as a mother of now teen and tween. Uh, it's a very different landscape than when I started homeschooling. So in general, I am not a big technology for kids person. Um, I obviously like kids to go outside and I think that interacting with the real environment and other people is really important, especially as our brains are developing. And there has been a lot of research about um, how it, a lot of technology can affect brain development. Um, so I am really not a fan of it, especially like under five, even under eight. Um, however, we live in a technological world. So we do need, eventually, kids will need um, to be able to use a computer. They do usually pick it up relatively quickly. Um, so I'm not saying no technology ever. It's also an extremely useful tool. Um, so when we're talking about literacy and reading and writing, we need to be able to communicate and we need to be able to share our ideas. And technology is often a really good way for kids to share their ideas and use their writing and their voice in, in a way that uh, allows them to be active and, and create action and share it and, you know, act, uh, advocate for things that are important to them or share information. Um, and so it can be a really good tool. It can also be a really good tool for finding out information, for researching what you don't know. Um, and that's also really, really important. And that's an important literacy skill. So it's not that I'm anti-technology. I just feel like um, we should really be careful of the technology and how much we're doing, especially in those younger, those younger years. It can easily surplant uh, books and conversation and uh, connection with kids. And so we have to be really careful of it. Um, it's hard. Most of my work, right, is on the computer um, nowadays. And as kids get older, the technology increases and, um, you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard balance. It is hard no matter where you stand on the issue. I think it's just tough. Wow, you are just a jewel, Rachel. And I have kind of a weird question. So you're a special education teacher. Are there any kinds of children or archetypes or learning challenges that have a an especially difficult time outside? And if you've noticed that, maybe there's not. What recommendations you might have for parents? I mean, I'll be the first to say that outside isn't for everybody. It, it, you know, it takes a little more effort on the parent part to get 
kids in the right gear and to spend that time and to go out there. Um, so it's not always for everyone, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing either. Um, and there's definitely kids that are more that the outdoors works really well for just like any, uh, learning approach, right? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. And so there are, you know, if you have sensory kids that have sensory issues that are very sensitive, um, that can be too much stimulation outside or, um, some kids are kind of, you might have to put a lot of effort into it if they're fearful of the outside. Um, there's a lot of books about that and you can really work on that and, you know, educate them about what are real risks and what are real not, you know, their kids can be scared of animals or like poison ivy and that, you know, and sometimes they get these notions and you just have to work through them. Um, so it's okay. Um, and, and yeah, not every kid's going to love it. Does every kid going to benefit? Sure. But we don't have to push it and say, oh, we have to be outside all day, every day, for sure not. But we do want to make sure that they get some of those, you know, amazing benefits of being outside and those experiences for that background knowledge. But um, it's good to have some exposure and get out there for those, that vitamin D. And <laughs> for sure, I love that framework. And I think also one of the things I've observed is that for example, if I go into a shopping mall, I feel completely overwhelmed. And if I go outside into a beautiful natural park, I feel completely at peace. So even if you are someone who feels things very deeply, an outdoor environment can be completely different to a shopping mall, which I'm sure every parent listening knows because everyone here has been outside to a park and I think and to a shopping mall. Although I will say some of the kids I tutored in New York City had never climbed a tree until they were 18. So that can be kind of wild. And your curriculum gives so many great uh, tips for being natural in, in an urban environment. Yeah. Yeah. I student taught and taught in New York City, City. And it was a really good experience for me being from a rural area. Um, you know, we went on a field trip to see what the woods was because we were studying uh, the forest, but they had never seen in a forest. So we had to go to a field trip. And I remember dumping leaves on kids' desks, um, you know, because they just didn't have that experience. But they have different experiences that are also very valid. I didn't know how to use a subway at their age. I didn't know what a city was. I'd never been to a city at their age. And so, you know, it's just a different perspective, but it's really good to give kids lots of different experiences. So they have all of those experiences to draw on. So cool. Would you have any advice perhaps for a mom or a dad who is homeschooling and thinks what you've done is so cool and might want to start their own business? Maybe let's be specific and say, right, perhaps they've been developing curriculum for their child and they want to be able to sell it to other people so they can benefit. I would just say start. I mean, put it out there, see what people think. Um, it's, it's a slow build and you got to have a lot of patience. Um, and I would say that, you know, social media has helped me a lot, but the social media, as you know, the climate has really changed and it's not as easy, I feel, to be seen as it has in the past. Um, and so, you know, work your connections and network and try to, you know, put out some engaging content. And I, I think if you just work at it, it'll slowly build. I mean, I did not get here overnight. This has been five years in. Um, and so I feel like, you know, I'm very lucky. I, you know, COVID did help me a lot for sure, because everyone was trying to get outside more. And so, um, you know, I've had some luck, but I definitely was a very, you know, a, a slow climb and, and, it's worth if that's what you want to do. It is um, definitely worth it. I would not say it's passive income, though. I don't. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> right. I work more than full time you're, on this, this is, and know. the whole family is involved, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So, and I think also you are 
interested in learning. So you're constantly studying social media, how to present yourself on camera, different business techniques, how Instagram is changing and not necessarily showing videos to all your fans as it was in the past. And so you're really an active learner when it comes to all aspects of the business. You have to be able... It's changed so much just in five years. Um, You have to be really... You just got to keep learning. You can't... you can't find one way and, and just stick with that because it's just a constantly this, the the way our society and, and everything works now. And so Rachel and I actually met such a crazy way because I was a huge fan of her curriculum and we're an affiliate. And suddenly, you know, I was said, OK, I want to meet this. I want to learn more about this person. And so I looked at her website and I realized that she lived in the same town that I was born in, Ithaca, New York, and where my mom still lives. And I was coming to spend a couple of months with my mom. And so we just had a beautiful meetup in Stewart Park outside. And I think it was very clear from that initial meeting that we were going to be friends for life. It was such a happy way to for two people to come together and start collaborating. And you've helped me so much as I've built my business. And I just am so grateful for all of the amazing support you're bringing to families in the U.S. and around the world. Oh, well, thank you. You're so welcome. (laughs) Yeah. So you love um, me too. (laughs) I do. I love, I miss, we often have some great work sessions together. I miss when you're not local. It's going to happen. It's going to happen soon again. (laughs) Well, thank you so much again, Rachel. And before we sign off, can you tell people where they can find you and get started with wild learning? Sure. So my website is discoverwildlearning.com. And I post regularly on Instagram and Facebook at Discover Wild Learning. And you can find about, about, about all my curriculum and the things I am doing. And my book is available at all major bookstores, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But don't forget your small local bookstores. And I have those linked on the book page on my website. Thanks again for being here, Rachel. Well, thanks for having me, Nisha. It was great talking to you.